Well, today is Valentine's Day, and I'm sure some of you may have some plans later this evening or maybe later today to celebrate. And uh, Valentine's Day is a great day because it's a day in which we celebrate love. And love, as the Bible reveals, is a wonderful, great, powerful thing. However, usually on Valentine's Day, as many of us know, when we think about celebrating love, usually it's through the lens of solely romantic love, right? On Valentine's Day, usually when we say we're celebrating love or today's the day of love, or we're usually thinking about romance. And usually that's what you see in movies or television all the time as well. We focus on the romantic side of love. However, the Bible reveals that there's a lot more to love than romance. In fact, I think Jesus reminds us that the greatest demonstration of love is those who are selfless, those who serve, and also those who give themselves sacrificially. So that's the type of love that I want us to focus on today as we go to the text of Scripture. We're going to be in John chapter 3, the most famous chapter of the Bible. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. And as we saw in the video today, we're going to be looking at a conversation between two men. And in this conversation, we're going to see the selfless, sacrificial love of God displayed to those who hear it today. So let us go to the word. Would you please stand for the reading of scripture today? There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from. And where it goes, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. You may be seated. So as we see here in this 
story in this text, we see this theological conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Now, as the text reveals, Nicodemus, he was a a Pharisee, as well as a ruler or a teacher of the Jews. So what this means is he was literally on the Sanhedrin council, which would have been the most prestigious, the most prominent, powerful Jewish political and religious organization in their day. So Nicodemus is literally like the highest of the high. He's like the morally, the intellectual, he's just the superior in this time period. But we see Nicodemus as a Pharisee and as a member of the Sanhedrin. It says he comes to Jesus at night. He comes to talk to Jesus at night. And we don't know exactly why he came at night. Some believe that maybe he was coming at night because there was so much going on with the controversy of Jesus because Jesus had just recently cleansed the Jewish temple. He had chased the money lenders out. He was calling them a den of thieves. He had done all this stuff. And then he also has started to heal and do some signs in their community. So there are many, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're starting to say, who is this person? Who is this guy that's doing this, casting people out of the temple and healing these people? Who is this? So Nicodemus may have been coming in the night because he didn't want everyone to know that he was coming to talk and to hear from Jesus. Some others might think that the reason that Nicodemus came was not due to fear, was rather he came to Jesus in the night because this would have been the best time to have an open and honest conversation without distractions. Many of us probably know what that's like to go and just spend some time in an evening where you just can go to someone's house and just have a good night of fellowship, a good, deep theological or a fellowship or just conversation just to have with one another. So we see that that's what is going on in this conversation. We have Nicodemus coming by night to talk to Jesus. However, we see something even more interesting in the text because when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, He says, we know that you are sent from God or that you are of God. And he calls him rabbi. So this is, one, it's showing that Nicodemus isn't alone, right? It says we. So it's showing that there must have been some other Pharisees that were likewise looking to Jesus, seeing what his signs were, and they're thinking, this man is from God. But then he also calls him rabbi. So Jesus, as you know, he doesn't have any formal Jewish training as a rabbi. He was not a formal rabbi. But the teacher of teachers, the ruler of the Jews, literally comes to Jesus and he addresses him as rabbi, as teacher. So they're saying, we know that you are from God. We know that you are a teacher. And we have come to see what you have come to reveal to us. And then Jesus then goes into the text and starts to teach Nicodemus. And the first thing that Jesus teaches Nicodemus is you must be born again to enter the kingdom. If you have your bulletins and would like to fill those out, that's the first point is you must be born again to enter the kingdom. Some people might think, why did Jesus go right into this. He just kind of just nails Nicodemus right in the head, right? He says, you got to be born again to enter the kingdom. You know, Nicodemus just gave him all this flattering stuff. He comes to him by night. He's like, you are a rabbi. You are sent from God. And all of a sudden Jesus says, you must be born again to enter the kingdom. You might be thinking, why is Jesus just getting so blunt with him all of a sudden, right? It was a nice conversation maybe at first. He's coming at night, coming to talk. But I think Jesus, what he's doing here is he is a discerner of the heart. Jesus knows what our greatest needs are. And I think that he knew Nicodemus as a teacher, as someone who knew the scripture well, he knew that his deepest need was to understand how to obtain eternal life through the kingdom of God. And that is something that I think all of us have a need for as well, to know how can I obtain the kingdom of God. This phrase kingdom of God is used throughout scripture, and it can also be referred to, um, it's synonymous with the term of kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus taught a lot about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. But it's interesting, when we look at the teachings of Jesus, 
you'll notice something. There's certain texts where Jesus seems to refer to the kingdom as now, as the kingdom has come when the king arrived, right? See, there's these texts about how um, when Jesus came that the kingdom of heaven was at hand and how these different things about how we can obtain the kingdom today. And this reminds us that there is there's some type of presentness of the kingdom. But we also know in some of Jesus' teaching that the kingdom is also far off, that the kingdom is not yet. So we kind of find ourselves in an already not yet type of situation. Because Jesus tells us how to pray. He says, pray for your kingdom to come, right? That we want the kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. He also gives parables about how the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that will start off very, very small, like when Christ came. But over time, it will flourish and grow into a great tree. He also uses an analogy of this yeast in the bread or the dough and how it expands over time. So I think what we see then is that this kingdom that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about is not like a normal political, like the Roman kingdom or the United States. What he's talking about is there is this spiritual realm, a spiritual kingdom that exists right now. And that you are able to partake of it, to join and become a member of this kingdom However, there is a future consummation of this. There will be a time where Jesus will return and the fulfillment of his kingdom will be where there will be a spiritual and a physical reality. So that's what Jesus is wanting Nicodemus to get. He's saying there is a kingdom that you can be a part of and it's here and it's coming. But here's the thing. You can't be in the kingdom unless you're born again. Now, think about this. You must be born again, and that term born again can also mean born from above, that same word there, born again or born from above. Jesus is saying that is the only way that you can obtain the kingdom. Now, if that's the only way we can obtain life and obtain the kingdom of God, it's pretty important that we know how to do that, right? But And that's exactly what Nicodemus is starting to feel the weight of. See, I think that this would have been very shocking for Nicodemus as a Pharisee to hear. To hear, you are not going to be able to go and experience the kingdom unless you have a rebirth. Because the mindset of the Jew was, if you are a Jew, you are chosen by God. You are one of God's elect. You basically have an in to God's kingdom. Likewise, many of the Pharisees would teach that if you obeyed the law, meaning if you did good works, and you're trying to be a good person, a good citizen, trying to live a good life for God, that that would allow you to obtain the kingdom. However, Jesus is saying the exact opposite here. He's saying it doesn't matter what your heritage is. It doesn't matter if you reform your life and live a better, good life. He's saying the only way is through rebirth. See, sometimes we hear this in our own society, don't we? People try to justify and say, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to experience the kingdom of God. Why? Because I'm a good person. Because I do some good things. I'm not as bad as my neighbor. I don't murder. You know, I might not cheat on my spouse. You know, they might list some accomplishments. But Jesus is saying this. It doesn't matter about your accomplishments. It doesn't matter about who you are, who you're born, what family you have, what church you go to. He's saying You must be born again. So Nicodemus is hearing this. He's not sure exactly what this means. But then Jesus then reinforces the idea by saying, you must be born of water and spirit. Many have come to try to discern what this text means to be born of water and the spirit. And there have been many different views, different concepts or ideas that have been brought forth. And I'll mention just a few of those for you. And maybe you can wrestle with the text and kind of think for yourself, what does it mean to be born of water and to be born of spirit? Because this is Jesus emphasizing what it means to be born again, right? So it's pretty important to be born of water, to be born of spirit. Well, some believe to be born of water 
means to have a natural birth, like to be born, humanly speaking, to actually be born. And then to be born of the Spirit is to be born then from the Holy Spirit working on that person's spirit in their heart. So that's one view, that there's a natural birth, and then there's a spiritual birth um, uh, through the water of being born. So another view is that the water is symbolic for the Word of God. So you must have the Word of God as well as the Spirit working to bring forth a new creation. Then there's a historically popular view, which is the water that Jesus is talking about is in reference to the water baptism of John the Baptist. So what he's saying is if you have received the um, teaching of repentance, because John the Baptist is preaching, repent for the kingdom is near. So maybe Jesus is referring to, if you accept the ministry of John the Baptist, which is pointing you to me, Jesus, if you accept that and receive then the Spirit, you then will be born again. However, all those views, I think, have some merit to them. There is one view that is not acceptable in this text. Some have come to think that what Jesus is saying here is to be saved or to have the Holy Spirit, you must be baptized and then receive the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism is essential when it comes to being obedient to God, but it is not essential for salvation. Think about that for a second. I am not saying baptism is very, very important. Vitally important as a believer, you should be obedient and you should be baptized. But you are not saved through your baptism. You are saved by faith alone. And that is what Jesus is wanting to make clear here, that you are saved by faith alone. So what I think that the main point of what Jesus is saying here, when it means to be born of water, be born of the Spirit, what he's saying is this. Our spiritual regeneration is only made possible by the Holy Spirit coming and working on our life. God, the Spirit, is our source of regeneration. And if we turn to him, it says that there will be this spiritual transformation that will cleanse us from our sins. See, I think that when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about being born of water and spirit, Nicodemus, knowing the Old Testament, would have probably thought of this verse in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. See, this is what Jesus is talking about. He is talking about how there is a supernatural transformation that God will do in your life. He will literally give you a new heart and a new spirit, but we have to remember that it is not caused by us. We cannot change or save ourselves. We must rely on God to do the work in our lives. So we, we see then the Spirit is the source of regeneration. However, as we see in the video and as we see in the text, Nicodemus still isn't fully getting it, is he? So what Jesus does then is he starts to offer an earthly analogy. He starts to try to explain how the Spirit works by comparing it to the wind. Now, what's interesting about the word for Spirit and the word for wind is it's actually the same in the Greek and in the Hebrew. So literally, when you look at the Greek for this conversation, he's literally saying the pneuma, the Spirit, is like the pneuma, the wind. So Jesus is kind of using some fun wordplay there to basically say this. If you want to understand how the Holy Spirit works in your life, how he works throughout the world, what you need to do is think about the wind. See, like the wind, it has these origins that are invisible, right? We can't see wind. We can't obtain or hold, clasp on to wind. Likewise, we can't hold on to the Spirit. However, like the wind... You can perceive its effects, right? If you feel the wind on your face, 
you know that it's there. You can recognize that it's present with you. Likewise, with the Spirit, though you might not be able to see it or hold on to it, the Spirit of God can be observed. Now, this is kind of cool because right now, the Spirit is literally dwelling in certain individuals in this room, right? But we don't know where it came from, what it was doing, where it was going. But at some point, for those who have been born again, who have been regenerated by God, you have literally had the Spirit move on you like the wind. And what's also cool about that is me, as someone witnessing and looking out, I don't necessarily know where that Spirit has gone, who's actually received and had that Spirit change their life. But the thing is, the Spirit is mysterious and sovereign. It's mysterious. You can't control it. But he's moving, he's working in people, and he's changing them. And that's what he's trying to explain to to Nicodemus. However, Jesus recognizes once again, he's not understanding. And then in verse 9, he says, how can these things be? He's, He's literally hearing all this stuff about the kingdom, being born again, that me as a Jew or my good works won't save me. So how how can these things be? But then Jesus then moves into teaching that you must believe in Christ to obtain this life. So what he's saying is this. The way that you have this spiritual rebirth, the way that you can be actually born again to be reborn, to be born from above, he says, you have to believe in me. See, as I said, Nicodemus is saying, how can these things be? He starts to express this doubt. He starts to express disbelief. And then Jesus then counteracts that and says, you must believe. Because I think that what we're seeing here in the text is Nicodemus is demonstrating the spiritual condition of Israel. See, as the people of Israel, and as Jesus was starting to come on the scene, Jesus says that they were not receiving the witness and the testimony of God. See, we had had the Old Testament prophets that were leading up for this Messiah to come. And then we have John the Baptist who was having this water baptism of repentance. And he's calling people that the kingdom of heaven is at, is at hand. Then we have Jesus who starts to cleanse the temple. We have Jesus starting to do all these signs and these wonders. And now what he's saying this is he's saying, but Israel, but you are not listening or not believing because you aren't receiving the witness and testimony of God. And that's why Jesus literally says to him, he says, you're the teacher of Israel and you still don't understand these things? See, I think this is also a reminder for us that you can know biblical facts without truly having spiritual understanding. See, you can know the Bible a lot, but not truly apply it, not truly have a heart knowledge. And that's where I think Nicodemus is at at this moment. Even though he is speaking to Jesus, he's listening to him, he's trying to learn from him, he still has some issues with his doubts and his disbelief. And then Jesus goes on to explain that this is what is hindering his knowledge. See, our revelation is going to be contingent or dependent on our uh, reception to God's word. So if you're someone that's wanting to understand God or his will or the Bible more, what you have to do is you have to start to believe what God has already given you. See, if you don't believe the things that God has already given you, don't expect to have an even stronger faith later on or to be able to gain even more understanding of the text of God's word. See, we must receive the things that God has given us first, the smaller things, and then when we do that, God can work in us and allow us to grow so that we can receive and understand greater revelation. And that's what Jesus says when he says to Nicodemus, How are you going to understand heavenly things if you don't even understand these earthly things? Because Jesus had just tried to give him a good explanation for how the Spirit works like the wind, right? He's trying to use a very common earthly analogy, how the Spirit works like the wind, and it's invisible, it's mysterious, but it's powerful, and it can transform you, can do these amazing things. So he's saying this, but Nicodemus, as I said, is not believing it, and he's saying, If you don't believe this about the spirit that I've just told you with the wind, how do you think you're ever going to understand anything about the Trinity or the incarnation or about how the suffering Messiah is going to die on a cross? See, he wouldn't be able to comprehend and receive this stuff because he hasn't first even understood that he must respond to the spirit of God. 
that he can't rely on his physical or his fleshly works. So he's saying you must then look to God. You must look to the Spirit for this. Otherwise, you will never understand the deeper things of God. So then he goes in even more and he says that you must have this new birth and it's only possible by faith in Christ. Because Jesus reveals in this text right after he just challenged him on not understanding the earthly things. He literally says in this text, he says that the son of man is the one that you must place your faith in. And the son of man is the one who has descended from heaven and also ascends back up to heaven. So he's saying that not only the son of man is a messianic term, it's a term for the Jewish king. So Nicodemus, he would have heard this. He would have said, the Messiah, the son of man is the king that was promised to come. And Jesus is literally saying, not only is this Messiah that you have been expecting is coming from heaven, so he's literally of a divine origin. He's also saying that that person is me. He's saying, you must believe in the son of man. And that son of man is me. That's what he's saying to Nicodemus here. And then he uses, once again, another Old Testament text to teach this point of faith. Numbers 21 verses 7 to 9 records the events that Jesus explains that when the people of Israel, they had left Egypt, right? God had freed them from their bondage and being in Egypt. However, over time, the people of Israel, they started to reject what God had done for them. They started to curse the bread, the manna that God was giving them in the wilderness. And they started to say, we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to our sit or to our slavery, to our bondage. We just want to go back. It was better there. And because of their sin, because of their rebellion, snakes, serpents started to surround them. And literally, the snakes started to bite many of the people of Israel. And they all started to die, to perish. But what God did is he told Moses, he said, Moses, if you put and form a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and lift it up, if you do that, anyone who looks to that pole, to that serpent by faith, will be healed. So Moses does this. God provides a way for people who were rejecting God, who were sinning, to be healed. They no longer perished. They no longer died. And then Jesus literally says, just like the bronze serpent on the pole, so too will I be lifted up. He literally says, I am going to be like this bronze serpent, and I am going to be lifted up. Now that lifting up references him being crucified, him being put up on the cross. And not only is it being lifted up to be crucified, but his crucifixion is also his glorification. So he's literally being lifted up and glorified as well as lifted up and crucified, which is also powerful to think about. But what Jesus is literally saying is, I'm going to be lifted up, I'm going to be killed for your sins. And if you look to me in faith, if you believe in me, like those who are bit by the serpents, you will be healed. But he's saying, like the regeneration, you will be spiritually healed. You will be spiritually cleansed. However, you must believe. And that's what the whole heart of all of the the Bible is telling us is that we must believe in the provision of God. We must believe that the Son of God can renew us, can save us, can give us life. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. So this life that Jesus is saying is it's available to every single person that is here today. Anyone that hears my voice, you are able and ava- the, the life that God is offering is available to you at this very moment. And this life that God offers is eternal. We see that in verse 15. This life that God is offering for anyone who believes, anyone that looks to Christ who died on the cross for you, you will be healed and you will have eternal life. Now that is what Jesus is offering Nicodemus in this moment. And that's what he's offering Every single one of us. Now you might be thinking, okay, so what does this have to do with love? What does this have to do with Valentine's Day? Well, the thing is, every single thing 
that Jesus was just explaining to Nicodemus in this text was all because of love. The fact that Jesus was even on the earth talking to him, the fact that he was even there all together was because of love. And that's what we see in the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3.16. What does it say? John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, what we see is that God sent Jesus because he loves you. The reason that Jesus is being lifted up and crucified is because God loves you. See, the driving force of the gospel, the reason that we even have a Bible, is literally because God loves you. You cannot have a gospel message without love. There are so many people that want to, you know, reinforce the fact that we are sinful people in the eyes of a holy God, which is all 100% true. However, if you forget this aspect of love, then you are missing one of the most fundamental things about the gospel. You cannot have a gospel without love because the reason that God sent Jesus was because he was so in love with you, so in love with the world, that he would send Jesus. So God loves you. He loves the world unconditionally. See, God knows every single thing about you, even the things I don't know, your friends, maybe your family don't know. Everything that is held in the dark place in secret, guess what? God knows about. But guess what else? He still loves you. He loves you without condition. He loves all of you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to have eternal life. He wants you to be born again and experience the kingdom of God. And that is literally why he sent Jesus, his only son. God demonstrates his love toward us in that Christ died for the sinners. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Can you imagine? Can you fathom What type of love that God literally has for us? I have a newborn son that I just love. It's so wonderful just to be able to hold him, to look at him, to take care of him. And I just look at him and I just think about his future. And I just think about how my job as a dad is to make sure that this little guy is protected. Right? That I take care of him, that he knows that he is loved. But do you know what God does? for you. He literally says, I have this baby boy. I have this son. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to allow the sinners of the world to take him. I'm going, they're going to spit on him. They're going to rip off his clothes. They're going to mock him. They're going to beat him. And then they're going to put him up, lift him up on a cross, and they're going to kill him. That's what happened to God's son. Can you imagine that? What if it was your own child? Giving up your own child. That's what God did for you. God literally shows the greatest act of love by sacrificing his only son, the perfect son, to die for you. That is what the gospel message proclaims. So no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard life is, I want you to always remember every circumstance through the lens of the gospel message. No matter what you're going through, God loves you. No matter how hard life is, God loves you. Jesus came and died for you. So no matter what, I know life can be hard, I know life can be difficult, but something is so profound here. Though life can be bad, it can be difficult, God loves you and sent his son so that you can have eternal life. So all of these things that are happening in this world that are hard, they're just a moment in time in comparison to eternity. And that is what God is offering each and every one of us. Jesus died so that we could live and experience the kingdom. And it's because he loves you. Now, one thing I just want to draw out before I transition to uh, the Lord's table today. But it's not just that God 
loves you, he also likes you. You know, there's so many times that we can think about our theology and we can think, I know in a general sense God loves me, but then whenever we start to pray to him or we start to seek after him, we think that he's going to do something that's cruel to us. But we need to remember that God genuinely likes us and that his gospel message is not a message of condemnation. Jesus literally says, I did not come into the world to condemn it. I came into the world so that you might be saved. So this literally, this message of John 3.16, the, the, the chapter of John 3, is literally a valentine to us. It's literally God saying, I love you, I like you, and I don't want you to perish. Now, someone might be asking this question, well then why do certain people perish? If God loves the world, he likes us, then why are people going to hell? Well, Jesus answers that text, or answers that question in this text. He says the reason that people perish is that they refuse to believe. See, God has made the way for salvation. God has made the way to enter the kingdom. All you have to do is receive him. However, he's not going to force you or coerce you. You have to willingly come to him. However, as Jesus says, there are people that love darkness rather than light. What that means is they continue to love their sin. They idolize the things of this world more than God, their creator. And that is the issue. God has made a way. He wants all of us to come to him. He's making himself available very easily, accessible. But you have to trust him. You have to give up your sin and believe in him. So if there's anyone out there today that has not done that, I want to call you to be born again today. I want you to feel the Spirit moving on you right now as you're hearing these words. I want you to believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior that died on the cross and rose from the dead. And if you do that, you will be cleansed, you will be saved, you will have eternal life, and you will be able to experience the love of God that came to save the world. And that is exactly what we are coming to do as we partake of communion today. If you have your elements and would like to partake with us, this is open to all baptized believers today. What we do when we partake of communion, as we are remembering the sacrifice, the great demonstration of love that Christ made when he came to the world and died for us. When we take these elements, we take the bread, it represents his broken body that was given for us that came for us. When we take the cup, we are looking towards the shed blood that covers and cleanses us from our sin. So when we partake of this, we remember the sacrifice, but we also recognize that Jesus is not dead any longer, that he is a risen Savior. He's a risen Lord. And now as we partake of this, not only are we remembering what he did, but we actually get to commune with him right now. We get to actually experience the grace and the love of God when we partake of communion. This is the most important thing that you will do all week is be able to commune with God, commune with Jesus Christ who died for all of our sins, who loves us and he offers us eternal life and access to the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father, we come to you right now. We have such grateful hearts for this powerful reminder that you showed Nicodemus and you reveal to all of us that you love the world so much unconditionally that Jesus Christ would come to the world to be mocked, to suffer, rejected, and to die so that we could be cleansed of our sin if we just trust in that provision. Lord, I pray that as we come to the table, as we remember that, that we would abide in your love, that we would feel your presence on us, that we would feel your love, and then that we would go out and show that same love to others, that we would love the sinner like you have shown us through the cross. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.